All right, it's time to talk about the neuron as we seek to expand our understanding of the human nervous system. So when looking at the nervous system, we need to talk about neurons and glial cells. Neurons are the basic functional unit of the nervous system. They communicate by using electrical impulses and chemical signals to send information throughout the body. To start, let's actually quickly review the different parts of the neuron so we can have a better understanding of the basics before we move into more of the complexities. The cell body of a neuron is called the soma, which is where the nucleus is located. This is what contains the genetic material that allows for the neuron to function. Extending outwards from the soma, there are dendrites. These are what receive chemical information from adjacent neurons through receptor sites. Once a signal is received, it moves through the neuron and down the axon fiber. This is the longest part of a neuron and is what carries a signal away from the soma and out through the neuron's terminal branches. Now the axon is protected by glial cell. Now this is also known as a swan cell. It's what wraps around the axon and produces the myelin sheath, which covers the axon and protects it from being damaged. It also increases how fast an action potential can travel down the axon. The myelin sheath does not fully cover the axon though. We can see that there's actually gaps. These gaps are known as the nodes of Ranvier. This is what helps promote the continuing action potential. Now as the signal moves down the axon, we can see it eventually ends up at the axon terminal. This is the endpoint of a neuron. This is where neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic gap, also known as a synaptic cleft, and sent to the receiving neuron. So we can see that neurons are what allow the central and peripheral nervous system to communicate and work together, which allows us to respond to different external stimuli. For instance, let's say that you step on something sharp. Well, your nociceptors, which are pain receptors in the skin, become activated. We then have sensory neurons, also known as afferent neurons, send those pain signals from the foot to the spinal cord. This signal then goes to interneurons, which are neurons within the brain and spinal cord. These neurons communicate internally and connect the sensory neurons to the motor neurons, which are also known as efferent neurons within the CNS. The interneurons send a signal to the motor neurons back to the muscles in the leg, which then causes your leg to move and pull away from the sharp object. You reflexively lift your foot away from the sharp object before even consciously registering the pain. This is known as a reflex arc, which is a nerve pathway that allows the body to respond to a stimulus without even thinking. The reflex arc helps with our survival. It's how the body can actually respond to dangerous stimuli without waiting for the brain to process the information allowing us to remain safe. Okay, so now that we've talked about neurons, we also need to talk about glial cells, another neural cell often found in the nervous system. These cells provide support for neurons. They help hold the nervous system together. Glial cells help insulate neurons to speed up signal transmission, facilitate communication between neurons, transport nutrients, and even remove waste products. Now, if you do need more help with the structures of the neuron, the reflex arc, or anything that we've talked about so far, you can go to my ultimate review packet and check out the exclusive practice quizzes and a short review video to help you review all of this information. All right, now comes the time though to change gears and explore neural transmission. To start, we need to talk about the all or nothing principle, which states that a neuron will only fire if the threshold is met. The threshold is the minimum amount of stimulation required for a neuron to fire and send an action potential. When a neuron receives a signal strong enough to reach the threshold, it triggers an action potential. This starts with depolarization, which is when positive sodium ions flood into the neuron, making the inside of the cell more positive. This allows for an electrical charge to move along the axon and to the next neuron. After the neuron fires a signal, it enters a refractory period, which is a brief period in which the neuron cannot fire again. During the refractory period, the neuron recharges and returns to its resting state. When the neuron returns to its resting potential, it maintains a stable negative internal charge. And I should note that when it's in this state, it can fire another action potential. Now, once a signal makes its way down the axon of a neuron, it is sent down to the axon terminal, where the signal is converted and sent to another neuron through a small pocket of space between the axon terminal of one neuron and the dendrite of another neuron. 
This tiny space is known as the synapse. Speaking of the synapse, we can see that there are chemical synapses and electrical synapses. Chemical synapses use neurotransmitters, which are chemical messengers that send messages through the nervous system, while the electrical synapses are for messages that need to be sent quickly and immediately. When neurotransmitters are sent, they diffuse through the synaptic gap to deliver their messages. The synaptic gap is a narrow space between the two neurons, specifically the presynaptic terminal of one neuron and the postsynaptic terminal of another neuron. The presynaptic terminal is the axon terminal of the neuron, which converts the electrical signal into a chemical one, and then sends the neurotransmitters into the synaptic gap while the postsynaptic terminal is where the neurotransmitters are accepted in the dendrite of the receiving neuron. Just remember, pre means before, post is after. So the presynaptic terminal is the one that's sending and the postsynaptic one is the one receiving. Now, once the neurotransmitters pass their messages onto the postsynaptic neuron, they unbind with the receptors. Some of the neurotransmitters are destroyed and others get reabsorbed. The process of taking excess neurotransmitters left in the synaptic gap is known as reuptake. This is when the sending neuron reabsorbs the extra neurotransmitters. Now, depending on what receptors the neurotransmitters bind to, we can see that the neuron will either get excited or become inhibited. Excitatory neurotransmitters will increase the likelihood that a neuron will fire an action potential, while inhibitory neurotransmitters will decrease the likelihood that a neuron will fire an action potential. This can lead to hyperpolarization to actually occur, which is when the inside of the neuron becomes more negative, moving the neuron further further away from its threshold or intensity level needed for an action potential. Okay, so we've been talking about neural transmission for a little bit now, and I do want to note two disorders that you want to be familiar with. Both of these disorders actually occur due to disruptions in the neural transmission process. The first is multiple sclerosis, which occurs when the myelin sheath is damaged, resulting in the disruption of the transmission of electrical signals leading to symptoms like muscle weakness, coordination problems, and possible fatigue. The second is myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune disorder that affects the communication between nerves and muscles. Antibodies end up blocking or destroying acetylcholine receptors, preventing muscle contraction and causing muscle weakness and fatigue. All right, so we've covered a lot already in this video, but we need to actually now delve into the different types of neurotransmitters. But before we do, I wanna remind you that if you need more help with neural transmission, you can check out the exclusive tips and tricks videos that I made in my ultimate review packet and take the neural transmission quiz to make sure you're truly understanding everything we just talked about. All right, so for AP Psychology, you want to make sure that you are familiar with how the different neurotransmitters impact behavior and mental processes. The nice thing for you is this class is is only going to ask you about these neurotransmitters here. The AP Psychology exam won't ask you about any others. The first is acetylcholine, which enables muscle action, learning, and helps with memory. The next is substance P, which helps with transmitting pain signals from the sensory nerves to the CNS. Then there's dopamine, which helps with movement, learning, attention, and emotions. After that, we can see it's serotonin, which impacts an individual's hunger, sleep, arousal, and mood. Then we have endorphins, which help with pain control and impact an individual's pain tolerance. Tolerance. On the other hand, there's also norepinephrine, which increases your blood pressure, heart rate, alertness, and helps with the body's fight or flight response. Then there's glutamate, which is involved with long-term memory and learning. Lastly, there is GABA, which helps with sleep, movement, and slows down your nervous system. Now, besides knowing the neurotransmitters, you also want to be familiar with a couple of hormones as well. These are part of the endocrine system, which is slower moving compared to the nervous system. The endocrine system is what helps regulate different biological processes in the body. But for AP Psychology, you don't need to know any specific information about the different glands of the endocrine system, minus a couple exceptions, such as the pituitary gland, but we'll talk about that more in our next video. All right, so now while you don't need to know all the details about the endocrine system, you do need to know about these hormones here and how they impact the body. Adrenaline, also known as 
as epinephrine helps with the body's responses to high emotional situations and helps form memories. It also expands our air passages in the lungs and redistributes blood to muscles and is involved in the body's fight or flight response. Leptin, on the other hand, helps balance our energy by inhibiting hunger. It signals to the brain that the body has enough stored fat, reducing a person's appetite. On the opposite side of the spectrum of leptin is ghrelin, which is also known as the hunger hormone. This hormone signals to the brain that we are hungry and also helps promote the release of growth hormones. Then there's melatonin, which is produced by the pineal gland in the brain and helps regulate the sleep-wake cycles, also known as our circadian rhythm. When melatonin is released, it helps promote sleep and is typically most prevalent in the evening in response to darkness. And lastly, there is oxytocin, which is produced in the hypothalamus and released by the pituitary gland. This hormone is also known as the love hormone because it promotes feelings of affection and emotional bonding. Now, I realize we just went through a lot of neurotransmitters and a lot of hormones pretty quickly. So if you do need more help, don't forget to check out the extra resources I created for them in my ultimate review packet. All right, so there's been a lot already talked about in this video. So far, we've gone over the structure of the neuron, we've talked about the reflex art, reviewed neural transmission, covered neurotransmitters and hormones, and now we're at the last part of the video, which is all about psychoactive drugs. Remember, psychoactive substances purposely alter an individual's perception, consciousness, or mood. These drugs can be broken down into a couple different categories. Stimulants excite and promote neural activity. These are drugs that give an individual energy, reduce a person's appetite, and can cause them to become irritable. Examples of this would be caffeine, nicotine, or cocaine. Depressants, on the other hand, are drugs that reduce neural activity in an individual. These drugs cause drowsiness, muscle relaxation, lowered breathing, and if abused, possibly death. Examples of depressants would include alcohol or sleeping pills. The next category is hallucinogens, which include marijuana, peyote, and LSD. These are drugs that cause an individual to sense things that are not actually there. They can also reduce an individual's motivation and can lead to an individual to panic. And the last category we have is opioids, which function as a depressant but have their own category due to their addictive nature. These drugs give an individual pain relief. Examples here would be morphine, heroin, or oxycodone. It is important to note that using different psychoactive drugs can lead a person to develop a higher tolerance, which would require more of the drug to be consumed to achieve the same effect. This could result in addiction and withdrawal symptoms. Now we can't talk about psychoactive drugs without also talking about how these different drugs influence the neurotransmitters inside our body. Some drugs act as agonists, promoting neural activity by increasing the effectiveness of neurotransmitters. These drugs can mimic neurotransmitters, enhancing their effects or boost the production of the neurotransmitter itself. Examples of agonist substances would be anti-anxiety medication, such as Xanax, which increases the neurotransmitter known as GABA. Agonist drugs can also block the reuptake process, leading to an increase in the neurotransmitter levels in the synapse, since the excessive neurotransmitters aren't reabsorbed. We can see there's also drugs that are antagonists, which end up decreasing the effectiveness of neurotransmitters. Antagonists either block the neurotransmitters from being released from the presynaptic axon terminal, or they bind to the postsynaptic receptors and block the intended neurotransmitter from actually binding. Examples of antagonist substances would be medication for schizophrenia, which blocks dopamine receptors, or alcohol, which blocks the release of glutamate, which acts as a depressant for our nervous system. All right, well, there you have it. I know that was a ton of information, but remember, if you need any extra help, you can check out all the resources inside my ultimate review packet. There's quizzes, videos, there's a ton of stuff for you there. Also, don't forget to answer the questions on the screen and check your answers down in the comment section below. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time online.